home and told the missus about it. And I says, I think I discovered two bodies laying on the a, on a side of the road on Devil's Creek. Two dead girls, many suspects, thousands of people interviewed, and this case is still unsolved. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Grimes sisters' murders. Viewer discretion is advised. Real quick before we get started, hello, my name is Mike. If you're new here, I tell three true crime stories a week here on YouTube, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I also tell short form true crime stories over on the Tickle My Talk. That was a gross thing to say. TikTok, yeah, every single day. So the links to that is in the link tree in the description of this video below. So yeah, please feel free to follow me there and all my other socials. And then if you want to join my Discord server, uh, please be over the age of 18 or else you'll be kicked out. Uh, but it's also linked below. And we also sell merch, like this owl t-shirt. The owl did it, you know what I mean? Anyway, we, sh we uh, ship worldwide. Worldwide, very proper of me. Thank you, you're welcome, what? So yeah, feel free to do that. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, please just email me. My email is listed below, or it's just Mikey at truecrimer.com. Just email me the name of the individual or individuals, uh, where it happened, when it happened. I'll add it to my list. I've got over 5,200 names on there as of right now, so it's gonna be a while before I get to that case. Uh, but I, I pick my cases at random to be fair. So I just, I can't tell you when I'll cover it, but one day. But anyway, shut up, Mike. Let's get into today's case. Barbara and Patricia Grimes were two of, I believe, seven total siblings in the Grimes household. And the family lived in the Chicago, like Cook County area uh, in Illinois. Barbara Jean Grimes was born first between the two of them. She was born on May 5th, 1941. And then her sister, Patricia Kathleen Grimes, she was born on December 31st, 1943. Barbara and Patricia were not only sisters, but they appeared to really be best friends. As a matter of fact, all of the Grimes siblings seemed to get along really, really well. And this was a, a very loving household, a typical, normal family, I guess you can say. They got good grades in school. They were popular. Barbara and Patricia were always known as being super well behaved. They literally disobey their parents. And it's also important to note that the two of them had never run away before, nor had they ever even discussed running away, nor have there ever been rumors of them discussing running away. They grew up in a very religious household, and their parents, like I said, they were very loving, but they were also very strict, you know. And, you know, the parents raised their kids to be respectful, well-mannered, listened to adults, to, to listen to the authorities. And by all accounts, Barbara and Patricia and the rest of the kids, they just always seemed to kind of fall in line. Barbara and Patricia were both humongous Elvis Presley fans. Uh, they absolutely loved him. They had seen pretty much every movie he had done and this included the film Love Me Tender. They had already seen that movie, I think reportedly like eight or nine times, and they wanted to watch it again. So right after Christmas, on December 28th, 1956, Barbara and Patricia, they would ask their parents if they can go down to the Brighton Theater in Chicago to go watch Love Me Tender. There was going to be a double screening of it at the Brighton Theater. And the parents were like, that's fine. The theater was a mile and a half, less than two miles from the family home. Sometimes they would walk to the theater, sometimes they would take a bus. Uh, but either way, they always got there and then they always came home. On their person, the girls had $2.50 uh, and that was enough uh, to get them into the movies and whatever concessions they may, wanted to, may have wanted to get. $2.50, that's what they had on them and that was enough for all of that, which is, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> you can't even buy a drink for $2.50 at a movie theater. 
I don't think you can buy candy for that price anymore. At any rate, they left their home at 7.30 p.m. that night, December 28th, 1956. They made a promise to their mom, we're gonna be home by midnight, and every time the girls promised they'd be home by a certain time, they literally always were. No one seems to know for sure, however, if the girls walked to the theater or if they took a bus. Regardless, they got to the theater because there were witnesses who saw them there. A friend of the Grimes sisters, Dorothy Weinert, uh, would later say that she was in the theater with a friend of hers or a family member of hers, and she was sitting right behind the Grimes sisters for the first showing. Dorothy and her pers the person she went with, uh, they left after the first screening. The second screening of the movie was going to start around 9.30 p.m., and so Dorothy Weinert, when she was leaving, there was an intermission between both screenings, and so she saw the Grimes sisters lining up at the concession stand to buy some concessions for you know the second screening for them because the Grimes sisters were definitely staying for the second one. According to Dorothy, the two girls, the the Grimes sisters seemed totally normal. They were just they were always described as like these inseparable sisters. They were always laughing with each other, and that's exactly what they were doing. I mean, there was nothing unusual. There was nothing. Out of the ordinary, there was no fighting. It they were. It just seemed like it was the, their normal selves. When the second screening was over, the girls should have been home by approximately 11.45 p.m. However, they did not get home at that time. Five minutes goes by, nothing. Another five minutes, nothing. By midnight, their mom realizes they are still not home. And so what the mom does is she sends... Um, one of the brothers and one of the sisters out to the bus stop nearby to see if the girls, you know, get there by bus. One bus goes by, nothing. Two buses, nothing. The third bus comes by, nothing. And so, so at this point, the mother is beside herself and she is panicked because where are they? They, they were supposed to be home by midnight. It's now 2.15 in the morning and they're still not here. So she calls police to report them missing. While they're doing that, uh, the mom is also calling all of the friends that Barbara and Patricia knows to see if, you know, maybe they're there with them. They said, none of them say they're there with them. What then followed was one of the largest missing persons investigations in the history of Cook County, Illinois. There was a citywide and damn near statewide search for these two girls that consisted of hundreds of police officers. You had hundreds of volunteers. They even had volunteer policemen from other counties and other cities coming to help. Within days, there was a task force set up that was specifically just for finding these two girls. They went door to door to door and questioning every single person they came into contact with. They went to the Brighton Theater. They interviewed as many people as they could that worked there. They tried to find as many people as they could that were there at the screenings to interview them. Obviously, they can't track down all of them, but they got as many as they could, including some of their friends that noticed them there. They made like... 10, 20,000 flyers with their faces on them, passing them out to every single person they walked by. When it was all said and done, they had interviewed, I shit you not, 300,000 people. 2,000 of those people were brought in for more in-depth questioning, meaning that these 2,000 people could have been potential suspects in whatever may have happened to the Grimes sisters, but at this point, they still don't know what happened to them because they haven't been found yet. That being said, they did get a lot of witness accounts of people who had seen the Grimes sisters after December 28th, 1956. Some people stated that as soon as after the movie ended, they had seen the two girls at the Chicago Transit Authority getting on the bus that would head east into the city, which would have been the opposite direction of their home. One of those people was an actual bus driver who said they saw the girls on his bus. According to him, uh, he let them off on Western Avenue, which would have been a, a random location for them to have gotten off on, and no one could figure out why they would have gotten off there. Keep in mind, all of these sightings are all 
unconfirmed. None of them have been ever been verified. Another witness came forward to police that said he was at the theater that night. He left the theater literally within moments of the Grimes sisters leaving after the second screening. He said he saw the two girls walking down Archer Avenue when they were stopped by a car that he just said was a late model green Buick. That the girls had stopped next to this car and were potentially seeing like talking to whoever was in it. But then the witness said that the girls never got in the car, that he, they, he then saw the two girls walk away, and then the car went its separate way. Then there were two teenagers, one named Ed Lorden, the other one was named Earl Zastro. They told police that they had been going through McKinley Park when they noticed the Grimes sisters. They said the two girls were seen at the park giggling and laughing and acting playful, almost like they were playing, like they were like jumping out from like areas and like scaring each other. And this was about at about 11.30 p.m. Security guard would come forward to say he gave directions to the two girls in the early morning hours of December 29th. And this would have been approximately 12 hours after the second screening let out. Another witness said they saw the two sisters at around 2.30 p.m. on December 29th. So, so again, the next day they were walking along Archer Avenue. A railroad conductor would say he saw the two Grimes sisters and they were on a train. And he said the two girls were looking for two sailors. So there, basically there were numerous sightings of them, not just on the night of the next day, but like literally days would go by and they said, oh, we saw the Grimes sisters here. We saw the Grimes sisters there. They were spotted all over the city. They were spotted all over the states. They were spotted in very different locations. And the, the thing is, is that if you put all these witness statements together, it wouldn't have made sense unless these sisters were like time travelers and had the ability to like jump from place to place, you know, to fast travel, if you will, if you're into gaming. Uh, it just didn't make sense that there are all these random sightings. And I, I was watching a clip on this and, you know, someone had made note that, you know, the Grimes sisters, to put, not to put it in, a, in like a, in a, a negative way, but they were plain young teenage girls, meaning they looked like every other teenage girl. And so it, it just it seemed like people were misidentifying um, other girls as being the Grimes sisters. So that's why they could never really corroborate any of these sightings. One of the sightings, however, would lead to the first legitimate suspect. So the owner of a restaurant called the DNL restaurant, this is on Madison Avenue in Chicago, uh, on December 30th, so this would have been uh, approximately a day and a half, two days after the girls went missing, at approximately 5.40 a.m., the, the restaurant owner saw the two girls in the restaurant. One of them appeared to be drunk. Keep in mind the ages of these girls. Barbara is only 15 and Patricia is only 13. So them you know, being drunk would be way out of character for them. But anyway, the, the owner said one of them was like staggering around, looking very intoxicated. They couldn't walk, but they were being accompanied by an older man. That man's name was Edward Bedwell. And they would get another tip from, I guess, someone who worked at a, I guess, worked at the Claremont Hotel nearby. Keep in mind, this is about five or six miles away from the theater, the restaurant in this hotel. But this hotel owner said, or worker said, he saw the two girls alongside Edward Bedwell uh, checking into this hotel around that same time, December 30th. Edward Bedwell was a 21-year-old drifter who was originally from Tennessee. Edward was living in the Chicago area at the time, and he was working as a dishwasher at a restaurant. There were people who said that Edward looked a lot like Elvis Presley, and the girls, like I mentioned earlier, and because they were seeing that movie, they loved Elvis Presley. And so that kind of made people think, oh, he kind of looks like Elvis, and, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, maybe that's why they went with them. Again, at this point, the girls still haven't been found, but they do find Edward Bedwell. Uh, the police do. They bring him in for questioning, and he's like, they were mistaken. I I wasn't with the, the sisters. So, yeah, he was questioned, and he said, I don't know anything about it. They were wrong. They were mistaken. But there's nothing they can do about it yet, because, again, they haven't found the girls. There were reports that the girls were seen going to Nashville, and Nashville has connections, obviously, with Elvis Presley, 
And it's, again, they, they can't corroborate any of this, but they have one guy who may have done something to him, but they can't do anything about it because they don't know where the girls are. And then January 22nd, 1957 comes and the girls are now found. This is roughly three weeks after the girls were last confirmed seen leaving the Brighton Theater in Chicago. A man named Leonard Prescott was driving down the road when he thought he saw some mannequins on the side of the road. It's always mannequins they think they see. And they were just over like a guardrail. So he stopped his car. Holman told the missus about it. And I says, I think I discovered two bodies laying on a, on a side of the road on Devil's Creek. So um, this was on German Church Road. When he hopped over the railing and he looked closely, he noticed that these were not mannequins. These were bodies. These were the bodies of two young females. So he goes to police. The girls were, one was laying on her back and her, her legs were kind of upwards. The other girl was lying on top of her um, across her head. It appeared that the girls were not killed in this location, but they were dumped there, driven there in a car, and then just sort of thrown over. And that's kind of how they just landed. But at first, you know, the police did not know who the girls were. And so they wanted to get a positive identification. And this is 1957. Uh, so this is different times. Um, but they had the girl's father, Joseph, come down to this location and he would look at the two girls and he positively identified them as his daughters, Barbara and Patricia Grimes. So this clip I'm, I'm about to show, uh, it starts with the, the father being consoled after um, he notices or he identifies them. And then it goes into uh, someone basically saying how long the two girls have been there. Do you have any idea how long these girls have been lying here? There's snow in between the bodies. There's some snow under the body. And uh, from the position and condition of the bodies, I would say they've been here into the a matter of days, three, four, five days. This is where all the confusion begins because nobody seems to, to can pinpoint exactly how long they've been there. There are differing opinions on it. The autopsy initially was states because of stomach contents, that the girls were likely killed no more than five hours after they were last seen at the Brighton Theater. But then later on, there would be uh, conflicting reports that the girls had actually been placed there only for a few days in where they were initially, where they were found, and that they had been killed right along that same time, right near the time when they were killed. So meaning they could have been killed either the night they went missing or they were killed four to five days before they were found. And that's that's a big thing because that means that either they were kidnapped and murdered the night of going to the to the to the theater, or they were kidnapped, or they ran away, or they they went with people willingly or unwillingly, who knows? And they were with those people for long periods of time and that they were eventually killed uh so there it's that really will fudge up an investigation because when did this happen what was their cause of death that also seems to be kind of ugh. one of the girls had a, a few puncture wounds on her chest not like full stab wounds they weren't like deeply embedded wounds but they were like punctures possibly by like an ice pick or something with a very, very fine, small point. They also had some bruising around their heads to ind indicate they may have been hit with some sort of blunt force object. But ultimately, the cause of death essentially was attributed to the, the weather, to the cold. It was ruled as secondary shock as a result of exposure to the frigid temperature. And it was also ruled as homicide. So that makes it confusing too. Like, what do you mean they died of exposure, but they were also murdered? Like, it's, it's kind of confusing. There are also conflicting reports on whether or not the girls were sexually assaulted or not. One report says that one of them, at least one of them, had had sexual intercourse just before she was killed. In some, they can't determine whether it was assault or not. It's just so, so conflicting. 
<laughs> which made it very difficult to investigate. What made matters worse is that, I, you know, some of the photos I'm showing, you see a whole bunch of people at the crime scene. Uh, there were people just trampling all over where the bodies were found, just with their shoes, with their hands, without gloves on. There was just, a, it was a mess. Uh, the scene was definitely contaminated um, by so many people. And so they probably did not collect all the evidence they could have collected because they may have trampled over it. They did say they did find uh, male bodily fluid in one of the girls and they saved it. But this is again 1957. There was nothing they could do with it back then. But they did save it. However, I will tell you right now that later down the road when they wanted to test this DNA against someone, it was lost. Um, and so at some point between 1957 and when they tried to investigate, you know, decades later, it had gone missing and they've never found it. You know, at one point, the, the, the coroner who initially had some of these rulings and findings, he was eventually fired. Uh, and then a new person was brought in. And that's kind of where the conflicts came in. It was just a mess. But anyway, this brings us back to Edward Bedwell. Um, who was reportedly seen with the girls on December 30th. Now, if you are taking into account the fact that the one of the coroners determined the girls died shortly after leaving the theater, then the sighting of with him could not have been the two girls. But then if you take into account to the other reports of them saying that the girls had been killed four to five days prior to them being found... Well, now this thing with Edward Bedwell, maybe it makes sense. Maybe he kidnapped them. Maybe she they went with him willingly. And that's why they were seen at the restaurant and then later at the hotel. Maybe, maybe. Uh, but it's, you know, at any rate, they arrest him. Um, and they end up charging him with their with the murders of the two girls. He says, I had nothing to do with their murders at first. But then, four days after he, is, uh, after he was initially brought in, he now has this long confession written out that he has signed, saying that he did kill the two girls. He kind of fit the profile they had come up with because they determined that whoever did this was likely between the ages of 20 to 24 or so, possibly a drifter, um, you know, a good looking man who would have been able to lure the girls away in some capacity. And so he kind of fit the bill. Uh, but he, in this confession, said he, along with his 28 year old friend, that the girls were with the two of them willingly. And they had been having uh, intercourse, I guess, even though he's 21 and the, the youngest one is 13. He says that they fed the girls. The last thing they gave them was hot dogs, which later on when they look at more at the stomach contents, they realized there was no signs of that in their stomachs. So that's one, uh, one discrepancy. But anyway, they said that after some time, the two girls were no longer willing to do what they wanted, the, the guys wanted them to do. So they beat them. And then they, they removed their clothing because the girls were found nude. And they just dumped them over the side of the road. Here's the thing. Uh, when the girl's mom, Loretta, hears this confession, she says, that's a lie. My girls never would have gone with these two men willingly. That just would not have happened. This 28-year-old so-called accomplice to Bedwell, he was brought in for questioning. He confirmed that they were with two girls, but he says they weren't the Grimes sisters and that they also weren't killed. But at any rate, they took Bedwell's confession. That's it. That's it. Done deal. Case closed. Boom. We've got him. Then he recants. Uh, he recants and he says... I only wrote that, I only put that confession because they had me detained for four straight days. They were beating on me. The cops were beating him and essentially forcing him to confess. They were not feeding him. They were, he was sleep deprived. And so he eventually basically was led to believe that if he signed a confession, he would be released. And obviously that's not what's gonna happen if you confess to two brutal murders. This confession also stated that both, that both the girls were drunk when they were killed. Again, there was no hot dogs um, in their system and there was no, they had their blood alcohol level, there was none. Like they didn't have alcohol in their system. So his, he would recant his confession and it all just sort of made sense that he did not do this. And so eventually he was acquitted of the murders. And, of course, he would go on to be accused of sexually assaulting another 13-year-old girl, which he was arrested for, and he was acquitted of that as well. 
and then he died in 1972. There was one suspect they also had named Charles Chuck Leroy Milquist, who fits the age range. He was young in his early 20s. In November of 1958, he was arrested for the sexual assault and murder of another 15-year-old girl named Bonnie Lee Scott, also in Illinois. Her body was found literally in the same general area that the Grimes sisters were found and in the same condition, nude and thrown over a guardrail on the side of a road. When police go to his house, they find a big old list of phone numbers of young girls. Um, and several of those girls, or at least a couple of those girls, were girls from the same neighborhood as the Grimes sisters. Police question all of these girls, and they all say they got these calls from this creepy, mysterious man. Um, and it was just, some of them met him, and some of them would say he was they were sexually assaulted by him. He was someone known to go to the Brighton Theater, where the girls were last seen. He had the means to dispose of the body. He had his own vehicle. There are people who believe that the Grimes sisters were probably either strangled as their cause of death in reality, um, and not this whole secondary shock thing, um, or that they were suffocated. Um, and it makes more sense, too, because... Uh, Bonnie was killed by suffocation. However, he was never actually charged with connections to the murders of the Grimes sisters. Melquist was eventually sentenced to, I think, 100 years in prison for the murder of, of Bonnie Lee Scott, and he would end up dying in 2010. About a year and a half or so prior to the Grimes sisters, three young boys would go missing, Robert Peterson and then John and Anton Schusler. The three boys were last seen at a theater, and they were last seen leaving that theater, and this was in 1955. A short time later, those three boys are found brutally murdered. They are dumped on the side of a road. They are also nude. They were also piled on top of each other like the Grimes sisters were. And apparently, you know, years later when the Grimes sisters are found, they are found, I guess, on the property that a man named Kenneth Hansen owned. Uh, and I, I think from what I understand, the three boys were also found on or near the property of this Kenneth Hansen person. Kenneth Hansen was known to uh, attack and sexually assault uh, typically young boys. He was not known to assault females. Kenneth Hansen was eventually arrested uh, like decades after these three boys is, uh, were found murdered. And that's how long it took them to like actually find him. And so he was charged with the murder of the three boys and he would eventually be convicted and sentenced to 300 years in prison. His name really wouldn't come up as a genuine suspect, however, until many, 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 many years later in terms of the Grimes sisters, when there was a kind of a new investigator looking at this case and realized, you know, you had these three boys go missing in the same fashion. They had gone to a movie theater. They were seen walking away, never seen again. Then weeks later, they're found dumped on the side of the road, nude, piled on top of each other. They appeared to have been killed in a similar fashion. Uh, and, and so people were kind of piecing things together. And so they wanted to, you know, decades later, take Kenneth's DNA, which they had on file, and they wanted to match it against the DNA they supposedly had on file for the Grimes sisters case because they found male bodily fluid, but that's when they realized, oops, it's gone, it's missing. So they've never been able to compare that DNA. But you also have some factors that don't make sense. Like if you're looking, if you're really basing this off of the typical MO, Kenneth would only ever attack young boys and never young girls. And so this would have been out of character for him. Bodies, the bodies were all found on properties that he owned or next to or near the properties he owned. They were found in similar fashion. Could whoever killed the Grimes sisters have maybe taken notice of how the three boys were found, you know, a year or so prior, and they just tried to match that in order to throw people off? Maybe. There are people that believe that Charles Leroy Melquist is a more accurate suspect because his victim, Bonnie Lee Scott, fit the bill, just like the Grimes sisters, similar, found in similar ways as well. But we, they can't really question him because he's dead. And then Kenneth Hansen is also dead. He died in 2007. So the one thing that did make Kenneth a potential, uh, bring him back to being a potential suspect is 
he was at the Brighton Theater the night the girls went missing. He was there. They found old documents where apparently Kenneth was one of the people who was interviewed many, many, you know, way back when, when this all first started. And that's how they found out he was at the theater that night. So that does place him in the area when they disappeared. So it's back to being a possibility. But we'll never really truly know because he's dead, the DNA is gone. Charles Melquist is dead, the DNA is gone. There were also four teenage boys who were at one point detained in connection with this back when it first started. They had been seen arguing with the two girls outside the theater. Uh, some say the teenagers were like throwing obscenities at the girls and trying to like lure them into the car or into a car. And But apparently those four boys were released fairly quickly. But the fact of the matter is, is it's now 2023 and this case is still unsolved. The unfortunate thing is with that DNA being now gone, um, the fact that the crime scene or the Grime sisters were found was so badly handled in terms of being trampled all over, just being contaminated by so many people. There really isn't any actual true evidence. Whatever evidence they may have at this point is probably degraded. You also have the fact that there were differing opinions on how they died and when they died. You had all of these witnesses who came forward to say they saw the girls at different times in different places and it really contaminated the witness pool, if you will. It really... It didn't, there was, the investigation can never seem to go in any particular direction just because of how many differing opinions and, and statements there were. And I saw them here, I saw them there, I saw them on the bus, I saw them get off the bus, I saw them at this restaurant, at this hotel, I saw them in Nashville, I saw, like, I saw them everywhere. So the, the, the question of who killed the Grimes sisters is unfortunately one of those things that may just be an unsolved mystery forever. Most of your suspects, if not all of them, are dead. You don't have any physical evidence that can you can even connect to them, even though they're dead. So the whole thing's a mess. It's a mess. Sadly, the murders of the Grimes sisters will probably remain unsolved. Pretty much the majority of their family, you know, are gone. The suspects are gone. The detectives are gone. The coroner is gone. Like everyone is slowly, you know, has died. And this may fall into the realm of like the Black Dahlia, you know, cases like that where you think you know, but you just can't ever confirm it. And quite honestly, I couldn't even say like who I think may have done this because I just because there's if you were to like present this in a, in a courtroom today, with whatever evidence they actually still have, along with whatever witness statements they have, I don't think anyone could be like, oh yeah, this definitely is what happened. This is definitely who killed them. I don't think you could. And it really goes to show like why you need to process a crime scene in a more succinct way, in a cleaner way. You don't have 6,000 people trample the scene. And also maybe don't coerce confessions and beat people to a pulp to confess to a murder they didn't commit. You know, maybe don't do that. It's just sad that you have these two very young girls whose lives were taken at such a young age by some monster, by some monster lurking in the shadows. And that monster has since been vanquished to hell, if you will. Uh, but they went there as a free person, so to speak, never caught for it. And that sucks. But, you know, you never know. You never know. Because the way our the way we've advanced scientifically in forensics, you just never know. There may be something that comes out that says, "Boom! We can pull this off of this piece of evidence, and that can link to a person." And maybe it's not DNA. Maybe it's not fingerprints. It's not hair. Maybe it's something else. You never know. Things could happen. But as of right now, the murder of the Grime sisters has gone unsolved, and as of right now, will probably remain. An unsolved mystery. But that is it for this case. True crime of Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. Hope you found it interesting. Interesting. Why are you singing? Hey, I'm filming this on Halloween. Boo! <laughs> you stupid idiots. You got scared, didn't you? No, you didn't. <sighs> this is awkward. I don't wish.
Um, that was goodbye from planet Neptunium of the third solar quantum physics area of this place, this place called space. It's with stars and uh, stuff. It's got like a couple stars, I think, up there. Uh, that was a language that I learned when I was abducted and taken to planet what did I say? Uranium, uranium to titanium, titanium. What? Um, huh. Well, this is uncomfortable. I was going somewhere with this, but then I never do. See you later, al alligators. <laughs> Crocodile, Dundee. That's not a knife. That's a knife. What? Okay. <laughs> See, see ya.